In the mid-1970s, a group of historians and scholars were intrigued by a name they continued to find throughout various Kansas City directories in their attempts to learn more about the city's history. Time and research would unveil the forgotten triumph of the woman who helped build the foundations for modern-day Kansas City. Nell Elizabeth Nichols Peters died on October 7, 1974, of heart disease in a retirement home in Sedalia, Missouri. Having hit her peak in the 20s, Nell had since only worked on small projects, her later work consisting mainly of designing renovations for buildings. These were projects she could draft in the comfort of her home, skipping the hassle of having to scout the location and oversee development. Her final project was a simple one, designing the addition of an educational wing to the Methodist Church in Butler, Missouri, a departure from her days of designing the layouts for multi-level apartment buildings and hotels. But those days were long forgotten, her name nothing but a few scribbles at the bottom of aging blueprints to aging buildings. Over the course of her career, Peters designed over 1,000 buildings in cities ranging from small Missouri locales to the eastern stretches of North Carolina. So how does a woman with such an illustrious background fall from history's memory? And how did she come to be the great woman that she was? To understand that, we must first go back. Born December 11, 1884 to a prairie family in Niagara, North Dakota, Nell Nichols grew up an artistic child with a passion for mathematics. After school, she would journey to the public library, checking out geometry and algebra books for additional problem solving because her desire for learning was not properly abated in school. This was only the beginning of Nell's undying pursuit of fulfillment. She would come to make such defiance of the unsatisfactory a habit. Whether it was her grandfather's millwright blood or simply a desire to create that pushed her, Nell continued with her passions, her drawings becoming ever more intricate. From the threading on a screw to an engine, she blossomed as a mechanical artist. By the time Nell decided to pursue higher education, her family had moved from their small prairie farm to Storm Lake, Iowa. Nell attended Buena Vista College there from 1899 to 1903. After graduating, Nell sought to help her family financially. However, disfavor with the status quo struck again. She was disconcerted by the idea of becoming a stenographer or a teacher, as was the usual career path for women of the day. That's when her sister gave her the idea to combine her love for drawing and mathematics and become an architect. The idea sent shockwaves through Nell. Not only would architecture give her the opportunity to pursue her passions, the sheer novelty of it appealed to Nell. A woman architect. That was something she could envision herself doing. Taking her sister's advice, she looked for work locally, but there was none to be found. So she relocated to the much bigger Sioux City and went to every architecture firm in town asking for a job. She was turned down by every single one of them. But to Nell, the woman who never accepted things the way they were, this was just another day at the rodeo. The next day she strapped on her boots and visited the firms again, determined to win a job. But this time, she brought a secret weapon. Her mouth. She talked and talked and talked until eventually she was hired by Frank Pottinger of Eisentrout, Colby, and Pottinger. Pottinger offered her a job as a bet with his partner. She was to work as a draftswoman, creating drafts of plans and blueprints for the firm. While working there, she gained training as an architect and attended several correspondence courses, eventually receiving licensing as an architect in several states. At this time, licensing was not regulated, so nothing hampered a person from declaring themselves an architect. What determined the success of an architect was not their level of education, but their level of capability, efficiency, and willpower. In 1909, Nell was transferred to the booming township of Kansas City. People were moving from their farms to the city in droves, demanding new housing to be built all over the city. An ideal scenario for an architect. Nevertheless, the new town presented some difficulty. 
With the influx of people came an equal influx of workers seeking to capitalize upon the mass migration. This increased competition and many seemed wary of hiring a woman to do what was thought of as men's work. With this in mind, Nell decided to branch out using the modest savings she had along with her tremendous amount of nerve that would continue to define her throughout her career. She established her own drafting firm as the gender nonspecific NE as opposed to Nell Elizabeth, a necessary precaution in making sure she didn't ward off any wary business partners who might pass on the thought of a woman architect. To further spare herself from judgment, Nell kept a few tricks up her sleeve. Upon being contracted to draft her first blueprint, she labeled it number 25 as opposed to number 1, so she would not be thought of as a novice. A novice she was not, and soon enough, her fortunes soared. She married William H. Peters and took on his name in 1911. By 1913, she had struck a partnership with builder and developer Charles E. Phillips of Phillips Building Company. With Phillips as her counterpart, her business boomed and her own personal style began to develop. Terracotta ornamentation decorated the exterior of her buildings, while the interior boasted practical, economical uses of floor space. Where other architects chose to design more lavish structures, Nell was known for her smart, sensible layouts and her ability to make a little space go a long way. 1923 brought tremendous change in Nell's life. She divorced her husband of 12 years, keeping in line with a growing trend of the 20s, women pursuing a more independent, freer lifestyle. Whether a result of her divorce or a mere coincidence, the subsequent year proved to be Nell's most successful year to date. She completed 29 projects in the year alone, including the biggest project of her career, the Ambassador Hotel. The Ambassador boasted 105 apartment units and 108 hotel rooms, with room for retail space on the first floor and a rooftop garden for just a touch of added refinery. By then, Nell had made a specialty of designing apartment buildings and hotels, many of which marked by her unique group court layout where she'd group a cluster of apartment buildings around a shared courtyard. Nell was the sole pioneer of this strategy in Kansas City at the time. It went on to be one of her defining ideas, so much so that she received national recognition in the architectural record, which featured designers from all over the country, only two of which being women. Locally, she was cited as one of the foremost architects of Kansas City. Her work led her all over the state and brought about ventures into the commercial buildings field by designing the lavish Lusier Cosmetics Company building. But the 30s would bring a devastation that would come to match and eventually overshadow her successes. The 1930s have gained worldwide synonymy with the Great Depression, and Nell was not spared from its path of destruction when it hit. The housing market plummeted as people left the once alluring cities. People were leaving buildings quicker than they were filling them, slashing the need for architects to make new buildings. The market stagnated as work in the architectural field could not be found. Without her business, Nell had to find other ways to sustain her income. She performed seamstress work, painted china and watercolors, and even published her own book of poetry. But not even that could sustain her mentally. Nell suffered from a breakdown during this time. She was confined to a wheelchair, hurt, and without the work that so drove her. The 30s bruised her and she would not heal for some time. As the depression passed and the world began to yet again call for new development, Nell too regained some of her former strength. Through faith, she was able to walk again. Through taking on small jobs, renovating and making small buildings, she was able to work in her desired field again. But she would never again reach the glory that she once held in the 20s. She worked on smaller, simpler projects, plans she could work on in her home as opposed to going out into the field and seeing a project manifest itself from the ground up. And this is where we started, the forgotten tale of N. E. Peters. How could a woman so crucial to the building of one of Missouri's biggest cities wind up so overlooked? It makes you wonder who else time might have forgotten. 
Who else built the foundation for the world we live in today whose stories go unsung? In the case of Nell, it was just a girl from a simple prairie home. But with all the hardship that marked her later years, hers is a story of triumph, of doing whatever had to be done to pursue her passion and succeed. Though her name might have been forgotten, her legacy lives on through the very buildings that stand today and the many people who frequent her structures. <laughs>